Good afternoon. Um, is this on? Yes. yes. So it is um, uh, a great pleasure and uh, an honor to welcome uh, Professor Gronje de Borca to the IIEA. Um, Professor de Borca is uh, one of the most uh, distinguished uh, scholars on EU law and its uh, relation to uh, national legal systems and international uh, legal systems. Um, today, um, Gronia is coming with a very uh, provocative title and uh, subject matter. So is the EU responsible for the rise of a liberal authoritarianism and the decline of democracy in Europe? <coughs> so um, we are at such um, a perilous political moment in uh, Europe that I think this is exactly the type of question uh, we should be asking ourselves, and uh, questions that uh, challenge the status quo. And so without uh, any further delay, I will uh, pass on, um, I will pass on the, the floor to Gronia. I would just um, ask you to switch your mobile phones to silent mode. Uh, you're encouraged to tweet with the handle at IIA, and so, um, contrary to what is common practice here uh, today, the entire uh, session is on the record, uh, including the Q&A uh, session. Go okay, on, please. Thank you. Okay. Well, good afternoon, and thanks to the IEA for inviting me here. Um, it is a provocative title. Um, and I also uh, sent in a little blurb, which was even more provocative because I referred to this uh, UK minister's comment uh, comparing the EU to the Soviet Union because of the terms of Brexit. Uh, that was just what they call clickbait. I'm not actually um, going to compare the EU to the Soviet Union. But I do want to ask um, about um, two related phenomena that are um, you know, very worrying today, one being the rise of a liberal authoritarianism. Um, and the other being the decline um, of democracy, the weakening of um, liberal constitutional democracy across Europe. And this is a phenomenon we're all familiar with, unfortunately too familiar with. Um, the most notable uh, examples are uh, Hungary and Poland, where in Hungary, um, Orban has actually coined the term illiberal authoritarianism to describe, or a liberal democracy, in fact, to describe um, the kind of uh, regime there. But more generally, we're familiar with this development towards um, an electoral democracy, which, um, once elected, then begins to consolidate power and to dismantle checks and balances, to control the media, to pack independent institutions, to roll back rights, um, to turn on minorities, and so on, and to uh, the populist element being to, to refer to um, a single people um, in which uh, to which others or outsiders don't belong, and a turn inwards and away from um, external cooperation and engagement. So a liberal authoritarianism is on the rise, not just in countries like uh, Poland and Hungary, but elements are coming to the fore in France, in Austria, in Sweden, even in Italy, in many parts of Europe, um, we see elements of this. And we also see a, a more uh, gradual erosion also of democracy, of liberal constitutional democracy, um, in many of our states, and this is a matter of grave concern um, to anyone who cares about um, democracy and uh, human rights. The question I'm asking is whether, because this is something that I've heard, and in fact I was asked to address this question at a previous um, event, and it made me think, well, what is the EU's role in this, these really, uh, this unhappy turn of events, the place where we find ourselves is the European Union and its system of supranational government, governance, um, its system of integration, is it responsible? You know, what's the role, what's the relationship of the EU um, to these developments? So that's the question um, that I'm asking. Um, now, unfortunately, the PowerPoint is very uh, small, so those of you at the back probably won't be able to read it. Let me go very quickly through. Initially, the question seems odd, and the reason why it seems odd is because the EU defines itself as being founded on protection for democracy, the rule of law, and human rights. So how could a, an organization that's founded on respect for democracy, the rule of law, and human rights, and has them in its criteria for accession, the Copenhagen criteria, which require any state to jo that joins 
to uh, respect democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. Those criteria, even though they were only put into the treaty um, at the time of um, the Amsterdam uh, Treaty in the late 1990s, have been there as early as the 1970s when the, um, the dictatorships um, were defeated in uh, Spain and Greece and the Spain, Portugal and Greece acceded to the EU. Those conditions were put in to prevent a return to dictatorship or to make sure that those states would not be able to be members if they didn't respect uh, democracy, human rights and the rule of law. We also have Article 6, um, which addresses those three foundational values. Article 7, which is known as the sanctions provision, which uh, introduces a provision where the rights of a member state can be suspended, the political rights of a state, if it uh, backslides sufficiently on those requirements. So the EU seems like a project of democratization, spreading democracy to Central and Eastern Europe, and ensuring that it's maintained by its own member states. However, since the Maastricht <coughs> Treaty, this is what I would call the beginning of Europe's real crisis period, the Maastricht Treaty brought in a move away from functional economic integration to a kind of an overt political project, even if the political project was always latent, now it was overt, um, political union and economic, European economic union with a single currency. And this great shift you know, to a, an, um, away from economic integration to a political union brought with it um, a certain, uh, the beginnings of a backlash at the same time. And since then, at least, we've heard uh, a lot of criticism of the EU's own democratic deficit, the weaknesses of the EU's own commitment to an impact on democracy. But even since then, we have had really a series of you know, multiple crises or poly crises, as some refer to it, since uh, 2007, beginning with the euro crisis, the banking crisis, the refugee crisis, Brexit, the continued spread of Euroscepticism, the rise of the far right across Europe, and the emergence now of illiberal authoritarianism within states and illiberal governments coming into power in a range of states, states which are now arguing for a different kind of EU, overtly arguing that the EU should not be this uh, you know, liberal um, uh, system committed to a particular uh, version of democracy and human rights. So all of these developments have affected the quality of democracy in the EU and across Europe. So that's the first reason for asking this question. So I'm going to look first at three sets of developments across Europe over the last number of decades and talk about the relationship between them. Um, and then I'll move on in the last part of the talk to look specifically at the ways in which the EU challenges the way democracy functions, both um, across Europe but also within member states. But the three sets of developments that I want to talk about are, first, the growth of Euroscepticism. This is something that has been spreading um, over the last number of decades. Second is the rise of the far right and the spread of illiberalism uh, and authoritarianism across Europe. And the third is a growing opposition to what's referred to as economic neoliberalism, uh, a kind of a, um, a, the presentation of the system of global capitalism in its modern functioning. Um, it's uh, referred to as economic neoliberalism. And the EU is seen to embody a particular regional version of that. Um, and I'll come back to this and talk about it in a little more depth. So I'll take each of these in turn, the growth of Euroscepticism, the growth of the far right, and the turn against economic neoliberalism, and talk about the relationship between them. So Euroscepticism, broadly speaking, is the is opposition to the EU. To the, to, you know, uh, it, the reason why we have a distinct term for it, we don't have anything like that domestically. What would be opposition to Ireland, to opposition to the state? Maybe anarchy, something of that kind, but we don't really have something of that kind at the nation state level, maybe separatist movements might be something of that kind, but we have um, uh, Euroscepticism in the EU and there, there have been hard and soft versions, hard versions being opposition to the existence of the EU, to the EU's very, the very idea of European Union. Soft Euroscepticism we've seen in terms of you know, scepticism about what the EU currently stands for, what it does, broader than just this policy and that policy, but what it stands for, the kind of EU we have. And there's left versus right Euroscepticism. The more familiar one is right-wing Euroscepticism. Um, you know, we've seen this in, I, I would think of this as the kind of force that really came to the forefront in the Brexit um, debate, that idea of um, you know, the EU as kind of controlling, taking away national sovereignty, preventing states from running their own show. 
left uh, Euroscepticism was more of the kind, and I'll talk about that when I talk about economic neoliberalism, that it was a corporate Europe. It was a Europe for the, for the wealthy, a Europe for um, business and not for the people. But there were these different variants. The main concerns, I think, being the dilution of national sovereignty, so undermining the capacity of states to do their own thing, uh, including their economic sovereignty, and more recently and more noticeably opposition to migration to a liberal or an open immigration policy. And these, the two dimensions are, they're believed to undermine economic security and also cultural identity or cultural homogeneity or unity. Um, and in a sense, a kind of an opposition, so Euroscepticism, I'm going to argue, is a kind of a regional version of a broader move that we see in recent years, which is a, a new political cleavage, not just right-left, which we think of as a natural social cleavage, but also a new cleavage in our interdependent world a globalism nationalism or transnationalism nationalism cleavage and in the EU that reflects itself in a Eurosceptical or pro-European um, kind of cleavage. Um, so that's sort of uh, explaining, sorry, explaining the growth of Euroscepticism and that's been um, something that's really on the rise since the, since the Maastricht moment I would say that it's really grown. It's always been there to some extent in a latent way and I think the UK and Denmark the, the states that were always a little unsure about joining and ambivalent at best about joining the EU always had that element um, within them, a resistance to the idea of losing sovereignty, but um, it has grown uh, and spread beyond those states and came to its kind of apotheosis, you could say, in the UK with the decision to leave. The second development then, the rise of the far right. And so there is a very big, for academics, a very big literature on this, on this phenomenon, the rise of the far right. And the sad thing is that it is not a recent development. We might be very aware of it now because it's become overt, because there are neo-Nazis in many, you know, overt movements in many states in a way that no one ever thought possible after the, just after the Second World War. But it has been a secular trend over many decades, and it's been traced by um, political scientists looking at how the far right, you know, this, th there is an element in society, there always has been, always will be, that this strand reflects... But how did it emerge and grow so strong again after it had been apparently defeated or pushed out to the margins after World War II? Now, one of the ways in which that happened was through the far right successfully learning and reframing themselves as the true cultural um, upholders of the civic values of the nation. You know, so so cleaning up their act instead of being the boot boys, uh, being the, the the real receptacle, the, the, those who really understand the true civic nation. Secondly, this, this phenomenon, written about by a very um, eminent Irish academic who sadly passed away um, a few years ago, Peter Mayer, wrote extensively about um, the sort of move against the establishment, the shift away from traditional political parties and the political system that's been happening for some time, not just in, in the EU. So Euroscepticism ties in with this, but it's, it's a disenchantment also just with the political system, uh, just a cynicism about whether it really delivers and whose interest it's serving and so on. And, and that uh, was taken advantage of by the far right who were like, we're new, we're something different, we understand your disenchantment. Growing concerns across the political spectrum about immigration, our connected world, as well as the wars we generate in parts of Africa and North, the Middle East and so on, and the, the vast uh, waves of migration which are generated partly through natural disaster but also through intervention. And so uh, concerns across the political spectrum about migration feeds into um, the agenda of the far right and draws uh, new support for those movements. And finally, uh, very strategically, the, the poaching by the far right of the policies of the left, the economic policies, the distributive policies of the left, challenging austerity, but not anymore from the left but from the right. Um, and uh, of course, always a redistributive policy for us, only for the real people, not for outsiders, not for refugees and migrants, but nonetheless, um, otherwise very much sounding like um, the left. And so that also uh, helped to um, spread and strengthen that movement. Then the third movement, which, as I said, links to these other two, is uh, an opposition to economic neoliberalism, which has also been a movement growing um, in recent decades. Initially, very clearly, a movement on the left, a left movement. So the pioneer writers on this, Noam Chomsky, Naomi Klein, Susan George, and Rena Hertz, 
there was an intellectual movement, but also a political movement, um, political activism, if you remember the, the um, WTO, um, the protests in Seattle against the WTO preventing that round from taking place, the establishment of organizations like TAC, the movements for a, a transac uh, international financial transactions ta tax, the World Social Forum, generally the anti-globalization movement, all of these sorts of political movements um, came, not came together, but, but uh, you know, arose um, and they were acting on or reflecting the ideas in the intellectual critique of global capitalism, which was that it is uh, really about liberalizing capital and free flows of, um, of capital for, and, and it benefits one sector of society, but not all of the others, and that it undermines and erodes um, all kinds of other values, environmental, social, cultural, um, and it leaves out a great number of, of people. So that... Uh, critique, um, the critique of, and it's quite developed um, by now, gradually began to be shared by those who became disillusioned with um, international financial institutions and um, the, the uh, system of uh, global capitalism as it was being uh, emerging and, and spreading and being instantiated. And it moved in, the, the more interesting and troubling uh, uh, move, of course, as I described, was that it then became not just uh, an agenda of the left and the centre, but also of the far right. So that the move against um, economic uh, neoliberalism was something that gave grist to the, the uh, concerns and the um, preoccupations of those on the far right. And so now economic nationalism is very much on the rise and um, different versions of the, the move against um, economic globalization and neoliberalism in particular are really gaining strength. And the EU as a project of market integration and market liberalization is and has been seen by a lot of its critics as a real kind of regional example of what is being opposed at the global level, which is this kind of economic neoliberalism with weak or non, I won't say non-existent, but weak social policies, uh, very weak uh, distributive policies, but very strong market liberalization, privatization, um, and other policies favouring um, economic actors. Oh my goodness, the, the writing's getting smaller as the slides go on. <laughs> How are these three developments related? Well, um, the short answer is that it's not, and I hope that that's become evident from the way I describe these three developments, it's not the EU itself that has given rise to the rise of the far right or given rise to the critique or uh, embodied um, neoliberalism, but the EU is part of the problem and the three different movements fed into each other. So the rise of the far <coughs> right, the real sort of origins of illiberalism and authoritarian sentiment on the far right, that uh, movement has been able to grow, strengthen, and really establish itself because of the way it spoke to the cleavage uh, against um, internationalization and cosmopolitanism and the move towards nationalism, which was not reflected in the programs of any of the mainstream political parties. All political parties, mainstream parties across Europe were pro-EU, um, conservative or left. And so these fringe parties um, began to appeal to the really significant sections of the population that are concerns about, worries about, uncertainties about what the implications of um, integration, globalization were. And secondly, um, the, the sense that that brand, the form of globalization that we had was really benefiting the wealthy and um, the, the business sector and not uh, people and was undermining many things that were valuable about life in um, smaller communities, particularly in the state. So those three different developments um, fed together and I think, you know, did uh, it, it wasn't that the EU, um, by ignoring these, um, was stoking the far right, but that the EU did not respond adequately, nor did member states respond adequately to those concerns that were arising, that the concerns about the extent and the shape and the nature of globalization on the one hand, and who was really benefiting from it on the other, and fears about um, migration. So what we have is um, the... the uh, far right and the liberal right benefiting from this neglect or this lack of response and that has left the EU in a position now where these um, the far right parties have arisen, have grown, have strengthened and the centre and centre right parties have begun in turn to borrow from them. 
So that what happens now is we have these parties that were centrist or centre-right that have moved further and further to the illiberal end of the spectrum and are uh, repositioning themselves electorally in order to try to, um, to copy and to mirror what's happening on, on the uh, extreme end of the political spectrum. So that's the first um, set of ways in which the European Union has not responded to and fed into, in some ways, the rise of illiberalism um, and, and populist authoritarianism. I want to talk now about a number of other ways in which the EU, despite its commitment to democracy, the rule of law, human rights, and the ways in which it's written those into its treaties and its accession criteria and so on, nevertheless challenges democracy. I'm going to put it in that way because it's sort of neutral to say it challenges democracy. Some of the ways in which it challenges um, democracy are deeply worrying. Some of the ways, I would say, are more uh, an interesting challenge to which we could react and states could react constructively and productively. So democracy could be renewed through the interaction of the EU and its member states. But so far, that hasn't been happening. And I'll try and end on a more positive note and say something about how the EU's challenge to democracy could be a renewal of democracy domestically and at the EU level, if there was a real uh, political will to do that. So two critiques that have been made about the EU as, you know, despite being committed to democracy, isn't actually or is weakening or is, is uh, um, not adequately democratic. The, the democratic deficit argument has, as, as it's been articulated for quite some time, one argument has always been, well, the EU isn't a proper democracy and can't be properly democratic because it doesn't have a demos, it doesn't have a people. You know, you can really, and that, that's an argument that says you can really only have democracy in a political community that is contained, like in the nation state context. Um, I think there have been very good arguments against this too, but none of them have ever been properly um, built upon in reality. In other words, the argument against it would be you can create a different kind of demos at the transnational level. There are connections between people feel European and European citizens have a connection with the European polity that isn't the same as their connection to their own state. But for example, the Scots who are really upset about Brexit say you often hear that I feel Scottish, British and European. So there are different types of civic connection. And so Europe might not have a nationalist demos, but it could have its own transnational demos. Nevertheless, that's been one of the arguments uh, used to say, well, the EU can't be democratic. A more serious one, I think, is, is the EU's democratic weakness is this, I'm just putting it in an overall sense without going into detail, it's lack of responsiveness to citizens. The lack of responsiveness of the EU as a political system, its institutions and so on, to the people. Um, that that's been a real um, uh, problem and it remains an ongoing problem and I'll come on to that in a little more detail. So the EU not being properly democratic itself. Um, there's then the, the probably the most serious critique is, but does the EU undermine or weaken national democracy? So does the EU erode, is it, is it contributing to this, what we're seeing, the erosion of national or constitutional democracy? So, you know, even if the EU is doing bits and pieces itself to strengthen its own democratic quality, powers of the European Parliament, um, giving the yellow card to national parliaments on subsidiarity, the citizens' initiative, policies on transparency, the institution of the ombudsman. It's not that the EU has done nothing. There are initiatives. It's, it's doing here and there to improve its own democratic quality. But there are two ways um, in which it is said to challenge national democracy um, that I'm going to mention here. The first being what has been called the problem of executive dominance. So this is a problem not just of the EU, but of international organizations more generally. And that is that they empower executives. So who goes to the international organizations? Who takes the decisions? Committees of ministers, the council. Um, that, that it is executives that are empowered through international organizations and particularly through the EU. And what happens when you empower executives? You are taking those powers away from parliaments or at least weakening them. National parliaments have really very, and it varies from state to state in the EU, but the extent to which they really control what happens with when ministers are participating in the European Council and decision making, it's a, a considerable dilution of the powers of national parliaments. So in all kinds of ways, that's just putting, that's just giving you the most obvious example. The problem of executive dominance and the ways in which executives are empowered through the EU has the effect of weakening and marginalizing the role of 
national democratic institutions, particularly parliaments. And it takes real effort and fight back to make sure that doesn't happen to strength. And some states have done it better than others. You know, Denmark has a very good parliamentary controlled system and so on. But many states, it suits them. This is the problem of what's sometimes called, um, uh, it's actually on the next slide, but called um, uh, uh, collusive delegation. So there's the element of collusion. It suits states to do this. The second um, way then in which the EU is said to undermine national democracy is its prioritization of economic integration and market liberalization over social goals. So I've sort of referred to this slightly in talking about the critique of neoliberalism in general. But in the EU, that there's always been, and it's become exacerbated in recent years, um, a, a kind of a, a, an almost deliberate treaty-based, law-based prioritization of the economic over the social goals in ways that undermines, and that's not just bad for the EU, the idea is that also undermines national social democracy, those states that have made a commitment in their constitutions <coughs> and in their political systems to social democracy. So here I've gone through a little bit the, the problems of executive dominance. I already mentioned the collusive delegation idea, the idea that whether intentionally or not, and it's sometimes intentional, that it suits states to uh, empower their executives to be able to operate free of domestic constraint when they go to these international um, meetings and, in, and to the EU, and even when it's not intentional. But also, and again, another Irish scholar, you think I'm only citing the Irish scholars, but they're the best. Deirdre Curtin has also um, written a lot about uh, executive dominance in the EU and the ways in which the technocratic and secretive ways of the EU, so not just that they undermine national parliaments, but they themselves operate with a kind of an almost compulsive um, sort of secrecy and that it's been a, a constant project. And again, another great Irish uh, woman in the EU institutions, in the ombudswoman, uh, I, we say ombudsmen, but anyway, ombudsperson, um, has done a, a great deal, Emily O'Reilly, in recent years to try to challenge this kind of technocratic, bureaucratic functioning of the EU institutions. So in fairness, there is at least the office of the ombudsperson now, but nonetheless, it's a constant struggle in the EU. There's, a, there's an inclination towards that kind of um, secrecy and technocracy and bureaucratic distance that weakens the quality of democracy. So that's a major problem for the EU. The second then way I mentioned that the EU is seen to undermine national democracies, undermining national social um, democracy. And here there's a, been a, an extensive critique by, this is German scholars mostly, on because Germany is one of those states that has a strong, it guarantees the existence of a social state in the constitution. So it's not just a political issue, it's a, it's a constitutional issue. Um, that the EU's what they call order liberalism rather than neoliberalism. This is stemming from a kind of a German intellectual school back in the 40s. Um, order liberalism being enshrining these rules as kind of immutable rules, free competition, market liberalization, you know, into constitutional systems. That the EU has kind of done that in its in the treaties with its free movement rules and its antitrust competition rules and hasn't compensated for that in any way with its social policies. Social policies are weak and marginal, contested and very um, diluted. Um, so that's the, the first way. Then, then on top of that came economic and monetary union with its um, the new monetary and budgetary constraints, the excessive deficit procedure, the stability pact and so on, that those further constrain the social choices and political choices of states. And then compounded by what happened during the Euro crisis and the ways in which the EU together with the IMF imposed these straitjackets on uh, the debtor on the bailout countries and that those, you know, each one kind of layered on top of another mean that the kind of taking Greece as the apotheosis of this, that, you know, the, the democratic choices and economic choices of states that are committed to some kind of social provision for their citizens are um, drastically reduced. So, conclusions. Um, there's a lot in, in, uh, of different uh, elements to what I'm saying, but I think I'm trying to say two different things. The first being that, no, the EU didn't cause the rise and consolidation of the far right, but many aspects of um, the way in which the, the response <coughs> to the development of the EU and the kind of EU that developed fed into and made easier and, and sort of facilitated the strengthening and growth of the far right. Um, and... Um, the, the lack of uh, an adequate response in mainstream political parties to the growing cleavage around nationalism, globalism, as well as a lack of response to the critique of economic globalization and neoliberalism in particular, meant that uh, center-right parties followed the growth of the far right and we are where we are today. 
that although the EU, then the second point is, although the EU aims to support and promote democracy, human rights, the rule of law, and has built those into its, its own treaties, executive dominance um, at the EU level, combined with the secrecy and um, opaqueness of its system of government, has weakened domestic democracy, has taken power away from national parliaments and other national democratic institutions, and its prioritization of economic integration and market liberalization has weakened national social democracies and their capacity to provide for their citizens. So how could I possibly end on a positive note, given all of that? Well, um, I am and remain a strong believer in the EU as a, a project of transnational cooperation, as the capacity of the EU, in the, I believe in the capacity of the EU to provide um, an alternative to uh, a more deregulated and um, a much less uh, humane form of globalization that could other otherwise states would find themselves confronting, that the EU as a system of transnational cooperation could provide, and, and in some ways does provide, you know, a system of cooperation that could enhance and benefit um, the welfare of all of its citizens, all of its residents, and um, it could be a, um, a very positive and also example to the rest of the world of how globalization could be managed. Um, but if it is to, ch to respond to or contain the challenge um, presented by illiberal populism and to avoid continuing to fuel support for these uh, parties which are claiming to respond to popular dissatisfactions, I think the EU needs to be more responsive and really importantly needs to take seriously um, the, the need to reform itself. So we talked a little bit about this before at, at lunch, just before this event, and I was asked, well, doesn't the EU really need to communicate better what it does, what it does well, and the ways in which it's made a positive difference to people's lives? And I do agree with that. I think some of the problem is about um, not allowing, you know, the the uh, populist right to kind of run away with the rhetoric and to uh, win hearts and minds through claiming everything that the EU does is bad and to try and show some of the things it does. But more importantly, I think it's not enough just to say, wait, wait, we've done good things. You know, there are things the EU does not do well, and I've outlined some of them in this talk. And one of the things the EU doesn't do well is to listen. You know, so uh, the EU does not, so the idea of reform has been discussed for decades in the EU, they're always reforming, but there's a reform circle Within, you know, within the elites, I'm going to use the words that the populists use, but you, you know, what I mean is within a small group of those who are concerned with the running of the EU. And I don't think it's very open to arguments, views from outside and to innovation. There's a sense in which it's almost like a fear that you has to keep doing what it always did because this is what it does. And if it doesn't do that, it's going to uh, collapse. And, and so it's an unwillingness to listen to some of the proposals for reform that are coming not from the usual suspects and the wise men's groups and the papers that are published by the think tanks very closely connected to the Commission and the Council, but instead to actually listen. There are a whole host of organizations, it's actually quite inspiring, the, of, of some grassroots, some civic, all kinds of different transnational groupings at the moment trying to respond to all these crises in Europe. There's a book I would really recommend by Richard Young, it's called The EU Beyond the Crisis, and he has a chapter in that where he describes, and he says this is just, this is just the, you know, the tip of the iceberg of, of these different sort of pan-European movements and different youth movements, um, because it's always with the younger generation where the ideas are going to come from. Um, and they're coming up with all kinds of ways of uh, reform, what the EU would need to do to reform itself. And I really think that is a major issue. And it's not just the EU, but states, member states, so member states are part of the problem, you know, not just the issue of <coughs> executive dominance or collusive delegation I talked about, but really of not being willing to contemplate reform, you know, holding on to things as they are for fear of losing influence and so on. But really, you know, the EU does need to respond, does need to reform itself, does need to change if it's to respond to the many, many challenges at the current moment. And I think, you know, I, I started the slide with um, a quote from Timothy Garden Ash, who I think spoke here recently, and I, and I agree with him on this. He says, well, you know, populism, and, and he was talking about the, especially the kind of um, right-wing version of populism, that populism, its opposite within a nation-state context is pluralism. You know, instead of this homogenous one people and outsiders are excluded and there's a sort of a speaking for the people um, by the government, that pluralism is the opposite of that contestation, pluralism, the many, and so on. He said at the EU level, the opposite of populism is the EU. He said the EU is the, is the 
opposite of populism. It is something, at its best, that's what the EU could be. And I agree with him, but I think that in order for the EU to be the best opponent of populism, that it, it needs to take reform seriously and to listen. So I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gronia, for uh, a presentation that was at once critical, balanced, and uh, very precise. And uh, I think that this is your hallmark as a legal scholar. So uh, you opened up uh, many paths for reflection, and I will immediately invite you uh, to ask questions to Gronia. And uh, will you please, before you do so, uh, introduce yourself briefly and uh, mention your affiliation. Thank you. Yes, John. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you very much, Gronia. John O'Brennan from Maynooth University. My question is about Central and Eastern Europe and what the EU might do to respond to the challenge of what Orban very craftily called illiberal democracy. What we're really talking about is autocracy, mm -hmm. the building or rebuilding of autocratic structures. Mm -hmm. Um, yesterday, you may have noted that the Central European University, one of the best in Europe, more or less said it was moving lock, stock and barrel to Vienna because of the intolerable encroachment of uh, the Hungarian government into its affairs. Just imagine UCD having to move to London because of the oppressive uh, policies of uh, an Irish government. Um, so I just want to ask you, what levers do you think mm. the Commission in particular might might have to respond to all of this. And there has, of course, been real criticism, especially from EU law scholars, of the Commission's failure to respond to what Law and Justice was doing in Poland, what Fidesz was doing uh, in Hungary. And belatedly, we saw an Article 7 procedure opened against uh, Poland, but not against Hungary, at least not yet. Now, there's a role there, of course, for political parties, for the European People's Party in particular, to stop protecting uh, Fidesz, but I just wonder what you might sketch out in terms of um, the capacity of the Commission to use leverage with uh, respect to Poland and Hungary, uh, infringement procedures, for example, other things of that kind. And it's not just about Poland and Hungary. In Bulgaria and in Romania, the problem is accelerating as well. So this is a systemic problem, and I just wonder, as an EU law scholar, how you think uh, the existing mechanisms and, and, and the proposed ones in terms of budgetary linkage to rule of law, how that might work out in practice. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I might take a, another question if it is connected to John O'Brennan's question, otherwise... Um, follow yeah, so please. Hello, sorry, Stephen Coots, um, School of Law, UCC. It's kind of a follow-up to that, and more specific, I suppose. It's in relation to the... Um, the interim order that was made by the court a few days ago um, and here the Commission acting I suppose as a technocratic institution undermining what the Polish government would certainly call uh, their democratic right to refashion their institutions and so I mean I just I suppose any comment that you might have on that and that there is a tension there right that you complain about the Commission acting as executive and technocratic and the court in this case as well um, to be undermining national democracy but again at the same time maybe that's the only way of securing it. Third question. Yeah, Francis Jacobs. My, my question is also related, but uh, it's linked up to how the European Union should respond to the Italian budget crisis. Yeah, okay. Um, so, so, my view, so one initial answer to John would be you know, you said as a lawyer, of course, the problem is, you know, if you're a hammer, all you see is nails. But so I, I think the legal response is really just one small part of a bigger set of strategies that are needed to respond to these. First thing is, I don't think there's a silver bullet. Okay, so I don't think it's well. We should have, you know, it's withdrawing structural funding or uh, the court or this. You know, what's happening is a change within uh, a state. Um, so what's happening is the people are voting for PIS. Uh, PIS is in power. 
uh, PIS is turning against liberal democracy, against constraints and governance, is turning itself into an autocracy, I think, um, through the constitution, um, you know, using, and, and by, by actually ignoring its own uh, constitution. So, I, I mean, I have a view on this, it's just, this is my view, and it's not, I know from discussing it with others, it's not shared by all, but my view is that if there are countries such as Hungary and Poland being the most obvious, but as you say, there are others um, really genuinely overtly coming to turn against uh, liberal democracy, because that is what, that's the model that's protected and that's what the EU was founded uh, as at a time when liber there was a belief in liberal democracy as a good system of, of uh, government. Um, I think the EU would be better without them. So I think the EU, so I, th I think they are, these states are not Eurosceptic states. They want to be part of the EU. They want the EU to turn into something. They, they would like to spread the model of um, illiberal democracy, you know. Um, I think that that's not what the EU was founded for. I would no longer, I would take back what I said there, I'm a supporter of the EU. I would no longer support the EU and I wouldn't regret seeing its demise if it became uh, pop, you know, primarily one of, of illiberal democracies. And so I would say that to the extent that there are a robust majority of states that remain committed to liberal democracy, that they should assert that. And that if it is the case, not that they're dealing with a delicate situation in, in a state and trying to manage it, but that there's a commitment on the, you know, on the part of the majority, then although there's a part of me that wishes, you know, it were possible to support those within Poland and within Hungary who are fighting to keep uh, democracy alive properly, to keep plural voices, uh, to, to protect the institutions of the state. If there's a takeover and so on of the courts, um, if the media is controlled, um, if, if, you know, uh, human rights organizations are uh, defunded and uh, imprisoned, uh, most of them, it's not just the Central European University, the Roma Rights has left, but many organizations, NGOs have had to move out or have been shut down in Hungary. There comes a point where then, you know, the, I think there will come a point to me where they're not, it's not compatible anymore with what the EU stands for. So um, I would rather there were a way in which those, I, I would like to see very robust, robust assertion by the EU and its institutions of these values with a clear sense that if you're not committed to those, there isn't a, a place here. So I'm, I would be, I'm very uh, disappointed with the European People's Party. I think this is, you know, long ago, uh, Orban's party should have been expelled. The problem is, of course, that there are many parties edging this way. So it's a bigger problem than just these states. But I'm, so I'll come to um, uh, Stephen's question about the court in a minute. But so I, I would take a, a strong view on that. The one that we did, we talked about this also before the talk, I'm not in favor, I think, of defunding, of removing structural funds. I think there, that may, there may come a point in a certain instance where that's appropriate. But while a member state is still a member state, I think that's a, a counterproductive way of responding to an illiberal government. Um, I, it's tempting, because you want to say, why should we be giving money when you're, but uh, you know, I can see a reason for, uh, there's, a, there's a regulation of the EU which defunds or doesn't fund political parties that have a very illiberal um, political program, and I can understand that, but the structural funds and so on, which can do a lot to um, you know, improve the, the quality of citizens' lives in some of these states, I would, I would be hesitant about that. But, you know, I, I'll come to the court in a minute, but certainly the use of Article 7, I think, is appropriate. I'd like to see it go further, and I, and I wish the, that um, the EPP had expelled uh, Fidesz. So, to the court, um, yes, it, the, the court is here telling Poland what it can and can't do. On this occasion, I think that's absolutely right. If you're packing a court, uh, if you've fired, uh, if you've breached your own constitution in order to do this and you've removed, uh, 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 improperly removed judges and are uh, replacing them with political appointees, um, then I think, yes, I think the Court of Justice is right. It, it's written into the treaties. Well, they're, what they're doing now is what they've done with you know, economic freedoms for years. So I think, yes, they are, and it is coming from on high and so on. That's one instance in which a court is saying you cannot, if you want to be a member uh, of this political system, you can't do that to your courts. Um, it is going to generate, I'm sure, um, a backlash. But I was, I mean, interestingly enough, I haven't followed closely enough. Uh, to my surprise, I read that the Polish government said, oh, we're going to abide by, yes. by the court's ruling. I mean, the interim ruling, which surprises me. I'm not sure what that's about, but I, I can't imagine in the longer run they've stood up against the EU on over and over on all of these different legal reforms. I can't say, or reforms, legal changes. I can't see that they'll 
they will capitulate now, but I could be wrong, and then that would be something very positive um, to see. I, I would take a different view on Italy. I don't think the voting of a, a budget, a state choosing to vote its own budget, um, is, I think the EU should tread very carefully here. Um, I think it's very risky uh, what the EU is doing at the moment. You know, they, they haven't enforced the Stability Pact rules against France, against Germany, against others in all kinds of situations in the past. These are very fluid. This is one of the areas where there's a lot of contestation around the EU's you know, uh, Eurozone rules. And I think this is one uh, a particular moment where they would be very foolish. Uh, and I'm very surprised to see the EU uh, responding as it has apparently done, which is taking this very hard line. I have no idea how this is going to end, but uh, it doesn't look uh, promising at the moment. This is exactly the kind of, con unlike the confrontation of the court to the Polish courts, where it's something very clear, and I, 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 I don't feel that um, this uh, political choice to take suddenly a very strict line on um, these budgetary rules is the right move for the EU. Thank you. Thank you very much. Alex White, <coughs> excuse me, is my name. I'm a lawyer and a former Labour Party minister. Uh, the former goes with the minister, not the Labour Party. Um, I, found, I found your talk really compelling, and I think particularly when the question that's been asked, because the, the, the force of the, of the questions that have just been asked are perfectly reasonable and legitimate, what actions can be taken and so on. But what you're focusing on in the question is what what is the EU, are the institutions of the EU, or the whole legacy of what the EU has been doing, itself responsible? And we have to address that question. I mean, actually, the Brexit debate is obscuring that because we're all mm. so concerned about it. So uh, can I just say, I think the question is the right question, or it is a, a right question. And I suppose I have two things that flow from that. First of all is your very interesting narrow, you know, point, which you know, it's not a particularly new one, I know you're not claiming it is, but you, you know, the, the, the predominance of the economic questions and so on to the detriment of any social and, for example, protective rights, workers' rights, the whole Delore uh, achievement of whatever two decades ago seems to have disappeared. What are the prospects, do you think, it's a largely a political question, what are the prospects for that being rebalanced in the period ahead? And the second question is this, I don't know if you have an opportunity to to read, it's a, it's a doorstopper, Adam Tooze's book on Crashed. So the emphasis there is, I mean, I, I don't think we can get away from in all the list of things that, have, that you've put up as being contributory factors. We cannot, I think, avoid the central critical importance of the crash and the legacy of the crash. And his emphasis, when you look at, when he looks at the European institutions and the response of the, is actually on the bank and on the ECB. And his, what he's written about it, I can't say that I've read the whole book, but what he seems to be saying is that the, if the European Centre, but the behaviour in particular of the Trichet Bank, was really, really uh, detrimental, uh, not just directly to Greece and other countries and to, to a lesser extent here, but it was a critical factor and has left a terrible legacy uh, in terms of how th those big central questions... I know you can never democratise a bank, a bank mm. is a bank, including a central bank, but the ECB as one of the institutions that really is one that we need to look at in terms of uh, how this thing is going to play out in the future. Thank you. And I'm a member of the Institute. Um, I was very pleased to hear you cite uh, uh, Deirdre Curtin. Um, you mentioned um, German scholars criticizing the absence of social provisions at the EU level, something that Delors drew attention to in a small article in, uh, about after, after, um, after Maastricht, you know. <laughs> Um, I don't read German, unfortunately, but I did come across an article by a guy called Scharf, and he talked about the deconstitutionalization of the um, uh, and majority rule as a means of, um, I, I think, if I understood it correctly, reviving the EU project. And the second one, and I want to quote something here, is from a, a, a Danish scholar working in the Copenhagen Business School, whom you may know. He talked about the European crisis of legally constituted public power. And um, he said, uh, in the short and medium, in the, in the medium term and long term endurance of the EU is inextricably linked to its democratization, something I think you refer to. A process of democratization which is taking taking the nature of polity and previous experience into account is most likely to succeed in a gradual step-by-step -step process 
rather than a singular constitutional exercise. Thus, in order to avoid a return to the past, European ship will have to be rebuilt in a step-by-step -step manner while still at sea. You hinted in referring to Jung's book that that's actually going on. I think the answer to your question is because the EU institutions don't accept that, the answer to your question is yes, they are destroying the European project, which I see is as a peace process with a common market and a customs <coughs> union attached. Thank you. So perhaps uh, you, you might start with uh, Alex White's uh, question about uh, the prospects of uh, rebuilding social cohesion and of perhaps reviving uh, Jacques Delors' um, legacy. You were sitting under yeah. his portrait downstairs. <laughs> no, downstairs. Oh, downstairs, yes. okay, yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, Adam Tooze is also, I think, an interesting uh, reference yeah. because he would give an answer also to the question on the Italian budget, yeah. saying that there's nothing as fiscal rules that are acceptable to all economists, yeah. which was yeah. what we were saying. Um, yes, I mean, you know, what's frustrating about all of the, and both of the questions in a sense, is that, you know, there are things that can be done, you know, th these aren't problems that can't be overcome. It's a lack of willingness to change. And the question is, where is the lack of willingness coming from? Um, you know, we could say the EU institutions are, you know, very much caught up. You know, it's not for the commission to decide on reform. This is, these are political choices. So it's the state's, um, you know, the state's willingness to, to have a strong social dimension, um, you know, for the EU, uh, a social dimension. The, you know, the Fritz Sharp paper on deconstitutionalization, you know, some of that um, doesn't, you know, it's not like there has to be some, uh, you know, changing of the treaties, for example. A lot of that was just how things were interpreted, uh, what kind of laws were passed and so on. You know, none, a lot of this is not inevitable. These are the choices that were made along the way. Um, similarly, you know, you said you, democrat, you know, the ECB, those were all choices, so, so you can't control central bankers, but they have choices. I mean, there has been a big project recently by um, Piketty and a number of others to democratize the central bank. It's called, uh, I can't remember what it's called, a DEM something, but um, Ten, yeah, yeah, about, uh, yes, yeah, to, the, to, the to bring in a, a political system which seems uh, like against, you know, paradoxical that you could control, but a way for, to, it's to democratize the Eurozone, in fact, rather than, but where the bank would actually have some accountability, even though it's a central bank and independent. So independence and accountability don't have to be against each other. You know, you can be independent and accountable at the same time. So there are ways in which these, uh, institutions could be reformed, these policies could be changed. And, you know, I, I share, you know, Donald's uh, sense of, of, I don't believe it's being rebuilt. When I said, um, you know, there are all these initiatives, I'm talking about, you know, uh, grassroots efforts to rethink what the EU could be, political involvement, had, but none of them are reaching, I think, those uh, who would need to be reached in order for ref in order for reform to come about? You know, in order for there to be a real commitment at the level of the council, the commission, um, and so on. I mean, the parliament is a bit more open in, by definition because it's elected and so on, but it doesn't uh, have the power and, and it doesn't take initiatives, big reform initiatives of this kind. So, I, you know, a lot of it has to come from the states themselves, um, and there obviously needs to be more of a sense of crisis uh, that the EU is really going to fail as a project you know it may exist like a what they call a zombie institution you know continuing on doing what it's always done but not responding to what's happening in the world the yeah something like that which is tragic to think it, it could come to that but unless there is some more sense of crisis of the need to really take the the bull by the horns and to and to do something more profound that responds to all this uprising almost of whatever is happening right now um a sense in which politics as usual won't do it um, and the institutions as usual won't do it but I don't get that sense from the EU either whenever I actually encounter you know people um, from the EU institutions there's a real sense of which no no we've got it under control it's business as usual which is it just seems so out of sync with what's actually happening out out in Europe in the states many questions I'll start with this lady Hi, thank you very much um, I have a couple of questions. One is regarding if you had a magic wand and you could change everything again. Sorry. If you had a magic wand and you could change everything again, going back to the coal and steel community of 1950, looking at the Treaty of Rome, going right through to Maastricht and beyond, what would you say were the main 
points at which if they had done something differently or um, had not done things, that we might not be here today discussing this topic. What do you think were those critical moments um, that you would say if they had changed different points in time, Nice Treaty, whatever, you know, just even from a legal social point of view? And secondly, do you think that the Irish Constitution, which I know you are very familiar with as well, obviously, um, is, is there... Do you see that as a very um, robust constitution um, comparative to maybe uh, the other um, member states' constitutions um, that actually is, is a very good bulwark against some of what the EU is maybe not doing so well? And I'm thinking about the way in which we use referenda, for example, to allow, as you're saying, there are much more um, feedback from citizens of states. Um, do you think that the Irish constitution is, is that bulwark against some of what the EU doesn't do so well, and um, the legal elements of that. Thank you. Yes, just behind you there. There, yeah. Uh, hello, uh, William Quill, a uh, lawyer as well. Um, I just, just a small question there was touched on briefly on the EPP and Orban. And uh, in terms of your third question there about the, uh, the opposition, sorry, the second, but the rise of the far rise, the far right, and uh, this is really uh, with uh, Martin Weber likely to be the, well, a strong candidate really for the next European Commission president and having got the support for of Orban in, within the EPP, granted with every other uh, uh, EPP government leader, but the fact that he specifically canvassed his support. And d does this mean that, uh, that there's essentially well, well, this is essentially my question is, what would this say about the willingness within a key European institution to address any of the issues that you've raised here today? Um, my name is Michael Farrell. I'm a member of the Council of Europe's Commission Against Racism. And you were, you mentioned as one of the factors in the rise of the far right uh, as being resistance to immigration policies. Um, the immigration policies of the European Union at the moment, obviously, this is a major challenge uh, to the European Union and to it as a democratic institution. But it, it seems to me that at the moment, what is happening is that the uh, leadership of the European Union is retreating to a more polite version of what the Hungarians and some of the other countries are doing, erecting fences, the building up the European border force and trying to keep people out rather than developing a policy for integration of people who are coming or resolving the situation at where the people come from. So what do you think about that issue? Yeah, perhaps, uh, yes, so a last question here in the front. Uh, thank you, Bobby McDonough. Uh, I just wonder, is there a slight risk of exaggerating the growth of populism? I mean, I think your presentation was extremely valuable because the European Union always has to see how it can reform and so on, but... Um, I mean, some of the opinion polls recently suggest that there's a lot of popular support that has actually grown since Brexit. So is there a risk of talking up populism? Uh, and secondly, this may sound a little bit facetious, but hearing some of the, the criticism of the European Union, uh, if you like, the European Union being criticised for some of the phenomena that are out there, it, it, would it be possible to compare that with a victim of domestic abuse being accused of, of being responsible for their own abuse? Um, I like that analogy. Um, so... I'd start with um, the question about critical moments. Actually, there's a connection between your question and that, which is that um, the phenomenon we're talking about is bigger than the EU. You know, I live in the US. It's happening there. You know, it's happening everywhere in Brazil. It's happening in Turkey. It's happening all over. So the crisis of democracy is a very big one. Um, it's a global one. The crisis of political institutions is a very big one. I think the thing about the EU, and maybe what's disappointing, is to see that a you know, an organization that was set up that could have challenged some of the excesses of globalization and channeled some of the benefits of uh, democracy um, has, you know, has, has not, I won't say entirely failed, but is failing, you know. Um, so there were lots and lots of junctures of moments for reform, potential moments for reform. There were lots of moments of, you know, uh, right back at the origins, the idea of having social rights in in the EU uh, treaties that was before the not even co not Cold and Steel but Economic Community Treaty in in EEC Treaty in 1956. There was a whole paper on do we need a social dimension, and that was always floating around, just like do we need a you know Bill of Rights? Do we need? 
Um, in the end, there were lots of opportunities for change, and instead, the incrementalism, uh, you know, in all ways, continued to reinforce mainly, I think, the the uh, the market emphasis of the EU. It was about building a market first and foremost. You know, sometimes I think that was a response to there was an early attempt for a real political union in the 1950s uh, with a serious kind of political integration, the capital P, um, that failed when France rejected um, a defence community treaty and, and the political community treaty was part of it and that failed. And after that, there was a sort of a, it was a mentality like don't ever go down that, you know, don't go down that route. It's, it's, it's going to only work as a common market. Um, that's where we have consensus. And somehow the consensus has always remained around the market. And that's still true today. The consensus is around the EU is good because it delivers a common market and we all benefit from this market. And there's far more contestation around the political dimension. So to me, in some ways, it's the same political contestation domestically about social policy, economic policy, redistribution, the corporate uh, you know, um, sector and so on, that those are just the same debates. It's, just, it's a much more unwieldy political system in Europe. So there were many, many points at which you know, change might have been made. Um, the problem, I think there is a bigger problem with the EU, which is just that the lack of political responsiveness of the system. So European Parliament elections don't correspond to what comes out of the Council and the Commission, only the weakest possible way. So there isn't a, a mechanism for making the political system responsive to what people want, other than through the states. You know, so it's the states, the, the ministers that are elected domestically that go, that they, you know, there's a lot more responsibility at the national level for what the EU is and has become. So there's always the possibility to change, always, just as we talked about the central bank. So it's about political will. And I think a lot about what, what's happening nationally at the domestic level. Um, I think Ireland has a, a very interesting kind of flexible but robust constitution. Very interesting, though, how we see referenda here because there have been some positive outcomes in recent years from um, referenda um, compared with, say, what's happened with referenda in the UK or elsewhere where referenda are used um, and come out with results that maybe are, become a big political block to either European developments or like Brexit, for example. So referenda are complex uh, tools. They're not complex, they're very simple sort of tools. They're just this vote, but they can, they have to be, um, it's, it's too, I think it would be a little too easy to say if you have a system with a lot of referenda, that's always a more robust system. I think it can be a very volatile system, but it's an interesting one. I think the Citizens' Assembly was a very interesting thing here. So I think there are really nice innovative initiatives. I, th I think Citizens' Assemblies are great things. Um, and they can feed into, keep a constitution alive uh, through that. But real participatory mechanisms are hard and slow, but they're really important. That's what keeps people in touch prevents this rise of populism. Um, I, I don't think, you know, po you know, the term populism, there are books and books and books written about it now. Um, if what you meant by it is a sense of popular disenchantment with uh, traditional political institutions, I think it's very real. I think it's very real. I mean, I think, you know, right-wing illiberalism, I think there's, I, I think there'll always be a lot of that and there'll always be left-wing progressivism and they're just two political forces and at different times one's in the ascendancy and there are reasons why at the moment the the right illiberal is in the ascendancy i hope the pendulum will swing back but it'll take human a lot of human action for that to, to swing back but i do think that there is a lot of um dangerous populism in the sense of just absolute disenchantment with politics as usual political systems i think ireland's very lucky that it's, it's both a small country, it has um, a, a, an electoral system that's quite responsive, uh, you know, it has, it's local enough to be able to be um, responsive, and for various reasons, I think, we haven't seen the rise of populism in, in Ireland. We've seen new political parties on the rise, like Sinn Féin, which have taken up the space, maybe, that um, the, the far right has in other countries, and it's not of that kind, and I think Ireland's very lucky in that respect. But I would never say never, you know, things change in all countries, so I think it's a constant politics has to be constantly renegotiated, and I think the most important thing is popular participation actually so it's, it's paradoxical we're afraid of populism understood as this movement of people to be to exclude to speak as one voice uh, to squash minorities 
to uh, let majoritarianism override other kinds of checks and balances. That's what's frightening about populism, not the participation part of it. So I'm, you know, sort of all in favour of reasoned and, you know, engaged uh, political participation. Um, yes, I do think the leadership uh, of the EU is is retreating in in this, you know. So and again, the EU is, you know, that is the council, that is the states that that, that come together. They are not taking, you know. Uh, developing strong uh, integration of migrant policies. Instead, they're building up Frontex, um, you know, because they're responding to their political constituencies and to what, you know, everybody is clamoring about, even when it's not a threat, like in Hungary, which doesn't have any migrants, you know, but migration is the big issue. So some of it is, is not real, some of it is real, but the concerns are certainly there. But I do think that the, the you know, the EU um, is you know, when we talk about the EU doesn't have this kind of policy, it's the states that are participating in the council that are choosing to take that response and to build up the, the borders and the fortress rather than to put resources into um, integration of um, migrants within the EU. I also think, um, you know, they, they, a similar sort of... Uh, uh, what would I call it? It's not, a, not the same question at all, but a similar sentiment behind the question that uh, William asked. Um, yes, yeah, so this candidate, I hope he's not <coughs> successful as president of the commission, but being endorsed by Orban, very uh, canny move by Orban, is very depressing. And if that's, you know, this is the, uh, the argument that the EU is going to end up, you know, defeating itself, and that may happen, and we may end up with an illiberal EU, you know, that gradually, you know, the building up of the um, uh, the borders and the Frontex and the um, prevention of the uh, refugee boats coming in on the one hand and then on the other hand uh, moving towards the far right and borrowing their policies and the centre moving to the right and so on and if that happens it will be a very different EU from the, from the peace project with the common market that has you know, evolved and grown and um, you know, if, if it does I, I think that's right, I think if it heads in that direction then we're talking about um, a very different uh, European Union than the one uh, that, that was created. And I, you know, sad to say it will gradually lose my support. Um, I hate to end on such a pessimistic note, no, we but won't, we yeah, have to I, believe I, it I, won't I, happen. Yeah. I might uh, take a last, uh, a hopeful question, please, Tony. Lift our spirits. Tony. Yeah. <laughs> What's the answer? Yeah. Um, Tony Brown, member of the Institute. That was a very simple question. <clears throat> How do you evaluate Emmanuel Macron? Is he real or is he a passing phenomenon? Yeah, uh, I, might, I might also ask uh, a question. You said that uh, the EU uh, can provide a model on uh, how to manage globalization to, to the rest of the world. Uh, what strikes me on the other hand is the way that uh, China was, was mentioned as, as a model by Orban in his 2014 speech on the advent of illiberal democracy in Poland. Um, China, the Asian model in general, mm. is, 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 is one that attracts a lot of attention. And even in Italy, as there is a lot of talk about sovereignty, the same um, economic mm -hmm. minister who is talking about mm -hmm. that is also organizing yeah. this fund yeah. to perhaps sell national assets yeah. to, to China. So what do you think the EU can offer, you know, or can, can, can yeah. oppose to, to yeah. that rising model of China and Turkey and... I, you know, again, it all comes down to what people choose. So I feel if, if the choice is stark and clear, you know, what the Asian model, the China model, the, you know, Singapore model, the Erdogan model is saying, we'll offer you, China's quite clear about it, we offer you economic security, you know, development, growth, don't ask for political freedom. So you don't, you don't ask for political freedom, we don't give that. Uh, you do what the, you know, the party chooses, the party leads and the party delivers and uh, you get, you know, your standard of living and so on, but not political freedom, no, no freedom of expression, no contestation, no challenge. Um, if people choose that, you know, th th what can we do? I think if the, you know, the EU can only and should only stand for the opposite, which is that political freedom and economic welfare belong together. Um, these are two things, they're, they're, they're part of the system that we believe in, the system of liberal constitutional democracy is that we believe in political freedoms and we believe in, in economic welfare. What's happened in Europe is that the economic welfare part and with a lot of globalisation in general um, has, has uh, not been, uh, that promise hasn't been met because um, we've seen the, the 
you know, growing um, wealth of the 1%, and that continues, you know, that, that part of society has grown wealthy, and, uh, the, but the wealth hasn't been spread, and there hasn't been a, um, a delivery on that uh, promise. And there's corruption and other kinds of things. Those are the things. Corruption is probably more than migration even, the biggest thing that, that drives um, illiberal populism, I think. You know, the sense that there's a, a kleptocratic state that, that you know, um, politics as usual is about, <laughs> you know, shunting the goods towards um, the friends of the politicians and so on, or towards the, the wealthy. So I think Europe has to stand for the opposite. I, so what, what I, that's what I would say to those who say, well, that's a different model. That's not what the EU is about. If the EU became about that, I would, you know, withdraw my support. Um, so I, I sincerely hope that the EU, uh, there's enough um, strength and support within the EU for continuing um, to defend political freedom alongside uh, economic security and welfare. Um, with Macron, the short answer would be, I feel like, to me, he's a little bit like the EU, <laughs> has lots of promise, but not living up to it. And there are many problems and, uh, um, you know, with him. Uh, we all wish he had been the great um, saviour that it might have seemed at one point, someone speaking up for Europe, speaking up for migrants, speaking up, for, speaking against the illiberalism and so on. But there are so many different uh, problems uh, with the way Macron is running France and dealing with politics internally that are really disappointing and um, depressing. Nobody is perfect, unfortunately, but anyway, we can only hope that uh, there will be some, you know, change there and that uh, he will not fizzle out as, uh, you know, another elitist that didn't listen to uh, what the, the country needed, um, what people were hoping for. Thank you. So listen is probably what we can finish yeah. with. And listen. Uh, maybe this is also a lead for this uh, institute. Listen to the, the, those who are not the usual suspects, and perhaps this is also a project for the future yeah. of Europe uh, reflection group. Thank you very much. Okay.